Of all the classical progressions, none is more famous than the one found in Johann Pachelbel's Canon in D major. Perhaps due to the overplayed nature of this piece, the chord progression over which this entire piece is built is viewed with some displeasure by musicians and composers alike. Maybe it is viewed as primitive or rudimentary, but I wish in this video to dispel that notion and show how this simple zigzag bass pattern can lead to so much more in music. Although this progression is known as the Pachelbel progression, it is far older and established in classical music. The origin of this progression goes way back to a period in music where the tastes of the medieval era were being replaced by a newer and less strict form of music. One of these developments was the use of the interval of the third. For a long time this interval was considered to be too lovely sounding and sometimes even salacious. Thus its application was frowned upon for a time. But once it, along with its inversion of the sixth, became ubiquitous in Western music, it became one of the most important intervals in Western classical music. The very root of Pachelbel's progression developed in this era in which Europe fell in love with the third. A simple falling third pattern like this is probably the origin of this famous progression. If we add the famous zigzag falling bass pattern, we can suddenly hear the Pachelbel progression very clearly. In fact, this very progression is found in Gillimus Monachus's 15th century treatise De Preceptis Artis Musicae e Praticae Compendiosus Libellus. This example is shown as one of his Regula ad Compendum Com Tribus Vocibus, or Rules for Composing with Three Voices. The most famous use of this progression is of course found in the famous canon written by Pachelbel, and although the piece is overplayed and is the bane of many a cellist's existence, and certainly takes the cake for the least inspired cello part ever written, I still feel this piece can give composers an insight into just how much musical material can be created out of one simple chord progression. As with many progressions or patterns in classical music, there are endless ways of voicing this chord progression. And while I can't possibly go into every single type of voicing possible, I will just lay out a few examples now to show the versatility of this progression. I will be marking each progression with a simple figured bass for those who can read it. The first and simplest thing one could do would be to invert the falling thirds into falling sixths. To create more color and tension in the original progression, one can also syncopate the falling thirds. This, in turn, can also be inverted into the interval of the sixth. If we continue this syncopated version of the progression, we can add some further complexity by employing the Baroque principle of diminution. In this case, the simple zigzag bass voicing is divided into a series of passing notes that lead into each anchor note of the original zigzag pattern in the bass voice. This creates a more dynamic and musically interesting progression. But we can go one step further and adopt principles of the late Baroque period and chromatically alter the bass and in turn create even more musical tension where the major sixths and fifths of the previous example become minor sixths and diminished fifths. This very colorful bass voicing can be found in Bach's prelude in C major from his Klavierbüchlein.
Is it not an amazing journey to go from quite a simple progression to a passage of a Bach prelude, which on the surface seems to hold nothing in common with Pachelbel's canon? This is the power of understanding how simple chord progressions in classical music can give birth to astounding complexity. So where else can we see the Pachelbel progression? Is it just a phenomenon attributable to Baroque music, or did later composers employ this progression as well? The answer is yes, and one composer who uses this very progression often is Beethoven, who would cleverly adapt it many times in his career, and in turn employed his creative talents to turn this relatively overused progression into something very unique every time he used it. First let's look at the opening of the scherzo to his Hammerklavier sonata. It might be hard to recognize the progression initially, but if I reduce the music to its harmonic components, the progression becomes instantly audible. Another time Beethoven employs this is at the beginning of his 30th piano sonata. In this case, I feel the progression is instantly clear, but nonetheless I'll reduce it to its harmonic scaffold to make it even clearer. Finally, Beethoven uses this sequence again in a monumental fashion in the final movement of his Ninth Symphony. In this section, Beethoven takes his famous Ode to Joy motif and grafts it over the Pachelbel progression. In turn, he is able to create some marvelous counterpoint, and the secret to that lies in the forgiving nature of the progression itself which lends itself magnificently to contrapuntal music. We've only just scratched the surface when it comes to Pachelbel's progression, but as you can see, it is incredibly versatile and can be used in many different contexts, and the secret to employing it effectively is in the art of altering and modifying it. There is so much that can be done with this progression, and perhaps more still that can be done with it. So just because it's hundreds and hundreds of years old and has been used countless times in classical music, and even pop music doesn't make it any less important to understand. If you feel apprehensive in using it, as you feel you're copying Pachelbel, you can rest assured that you are doing no such thing as Pachelbel has nothing to do with the creation of this progression, as it's far older. And if Bach and Beethoven used it, then why shouldn't you? A composer can't deny its usefulness, just as an architect can't deny the versatility of an arch. Thank you.